Good morning, everyone. First, I would like to apologize that I will not be able to be with you physically, but due to the corona crisis, which is also the subject of today, I'm not able to come to Hungary this time. But I'm very delighted to address this distinguished audience, and I would like to share some of my thoughts about the risk perspective on the corona crisis and its implication. I will touch three different subtopics. The first topic is what can the risk perspective contribute to a better understanding of a complex crisis such as the corona pandemic. Secondly, I would like to put some emphasis on the issue of systemic risks, its properties, and why that's important to understand the corona challenge. And thirdly, I would like to close with some hints about risk governance. So how can and should we govern complex risks such as the corona crisis? So let me start with number one, the risk perspective. While that corona is a risk is not very surprising, but the risk perspective offers a couple of very important advantages that many other frameworks for addressing pandemics would not actually be able to do so. And one of the main elements is that the risk perspective is from its origin extremely simple, but also very powerful. It has basically two major elements. The first one are the risk drivers, and the second one is the risk absorbing system. What does that mean? Well, we have some kind of a driver that creates damages or harm to others, and those others are the targets which we call risk-absorbing systems. Those risk-absorbing systems could be humans, like the health of human beings, it could be all societies, it could be the economy, it could be an ecosystem. Anything that is of value to humans can be a risk-absorbing system. And the other point that's important is that when we talk about risk agents, we could think about a millions of causes that could lead to harm to humans or to the environment. But with the focus of agents, we actually only have five. And that makes it much more manageable than thinking about a millions of different causes. What are these five drivers? Well, the first one is energy, and we know this from explosion or radioactive decay uh, or uh, heat or whatever. Um, a lot of natural disasters are the release of uh, energy, and that energy can, of course, have a very harmful effect on various risk-absorbing systems. The second one is substance or material. Um, this is, uh, for example, a poison that can create havoc among humans or a, a poison or some kind of a toxic material for the environment or for animals and so on. And a lot of chemical risks belonged in that category. Thirdly, we have biota and that we are very close now to uh, our uh, present crisis. And biota are bacteria, it could be mushrooms, it could be viruses. And they, of course, as we all know, have a major impact on human well-being, health, and also the environment. And then come the more distant one. Uh, the first one is information. Information can kill. If you have the wrong information, it can make people become sick or even can be killed. Also, we've seen that in the corona crisis, where wrong recipes or wrong advice could actually worsen the situation. But information has a much larger role in the society. Without information, without communication, most of these dangers would not even be conveyed to anyone. So how it's being framed in words and how it's being communicated is a very important element of how the risk actually extorts on the risk-absorbing system. We could also take another example that's the... Um, 
um, the economic uh, sector of a stock market. Again, wrong information can have a major impact on my stock value if I sell things that are good or bad, uh, or if I invest in something that turns out to be not uh, very effective. Uh, so all of that can increase my financial risk, for example, and that's based on information. The next one is money. And there is a little bit debate about is money a driver or cause, but I would like to put it as a driver. So money can drive risks and, uh, and it can amplify risk, it can attenuate risk, but it can also really create risks. And so in that sense, uh, money is also a driver for the various aspects that could lead to harm to the risk absorbing system. And the last one is violence. So that's human action. It could be crime, it could be sabotage, it could be war, whatever it is. That's um, something that uh, can, of course, create a lot of disaster and uh, detrimental effects on human beings, but also on things that we value. Now, if you take those things together, we can see that's all what we need in order to deal with any kind of risk uh, that we have in front of us. And the good thing about this perspective is that we can also concentrate on the interactions between those five or six. Again, if money is a little bit contested, but if you take money, then there are six elements, otherwise five elements, five main um, drivers of risk. And these kinds of interactions are ones that are most important, also in a sense academically most exciting, but also practically most relevant. Because we can see in the corona crisis right now is it turned out in the beginning as a clear risk triggered by viruses, by biota. But then it turned out to be a risk into several other fields. It triggered some of the other triggers. So we can see that it triggered right or wrong information and that has exacerbated or attenuated the crisis. It has triggered people, for example, to stay home and eat less and maybe dehydrate. Then we had, of course, a risk of substances that were the wrong substances that were taken uh, for food, for example. Uh, thirdly, it is very clear that uh, a lot of um, the measures that the government has taken led to economic risks. So uh, money was involved, money went maybe to the wrong places or not enough money was given to those who needed it the most. Uh, it may have increased inequities in society. So money has been a major trigger of secondary and tertiary risk connected to the COVID crisis. And then it sometimes even led to uh, um, yes, strong re reactions by people and they could actually go even into violent actions as we've seen in many demonstrations all over the world uh, that violence has been triggered by a negative experience of uh, COVID or its management. Now energy is less being released by the COVID energy so far we have seen that in some areas um, uh, chemical accidents has been released because there were not enough staff uh, around or even explosions have happened, but that's only a minor thing. But nevertheless, uh, what we can see is if we take those five agents together that matter in the pandemic crisis, we can see that an analysis needs to see how these various triggers interact and what they do to our risk absorbing system. So we can look at the human health aspect and we can see that, for example, the biota, of course, has a major impact of viruses on our health, but also the wrong information or the loss of money in the system can also lead to secondary health impacts. People are getting unemployed and we know that unemployment is highly related uh, to people being more sick, more depressed and even to life expectancy. And uh, we can see that a lot of suicides have happened um, as of consequences of some of these very negative experiences. Uh, we've seen that violence has increased, for example, in families where we had already a strongly aggressive, normally male, but sometimes female person, the family in the lockout has uh, given them more room to really exhort their violence and uh, their aggressive behavior. And we've seen also in the statistics, at least in Germany, that domestic violence has uh, increased quite considerably.
So what we can see through this lens is we can see the interactions. And I think that's very important uh, for a good perspective on um, the corona crisis. Since if we only focus on the virus, we may miss a lot of other elements that are very important in describing the impacts of the um, infections. And those are not just the direct impacts, but also the more indirect impacts. So let me summarize this first part again. What we can see is that the risk perspective consists of two major elements, risk drivers and risk absorbing systems. The risk drivers create harm or detrimental effects within the risk absorbing systems. So we can identify five or six of these drivers. There are not more of them, they're just those. And these six are intertwined. They interconnect. And in order to have a better idea of a complex risk situation, it's very important to understand the uh, intersection interactions between these five or six agents and how they amplify or attenuate each other. And then we have some kinds of multi-layered effects on the risk absorbing system. So in terms of the coronavirus, we can see that we, as we had first a drive of biota or viruses that was overlaid by problems through communication and information, wrong and good ones. They have attenuated or have exacerbated the crisis. We have seen that uh, in some instances that uh, toxic substances have or the wrong substances have been consumed and that has also put um, pathways towards um, other kinds of illnesses or to um, malnutrition or dehydration. All of that has happened in many, many countries. And then even more indirectly, we can see that uh, there is a violence uh, coming up, other kinds of information that leads to political polarization. All of that are some of the risks that we have to look at. So this perspective helps us to put things into perspective. Now, my second part, as I said, would be about systemic risks. And systemic risk is a specific subset of risks. We normally distinguish between conventional risks, that's like traffic accidents or, or um, you know, getting poisoned by something, and uh, the more systemic risks that have repercussions not only on the first risk-absorbing system, but also on other risk-absorbing system and interact with their environment. Um, and it can also challenge the existence of a whole system. So that's a second point that is normally associated with systemic risks. Systemic risks have a set of properties that are very important to acknowledge. The first one is they are cross-sectional, very often also cross-boundary, like the pandemic right now. So they cannot be governed within a specific political domain. And that is very, very important because very often our ministries, all our administrations are organized around a specific topic, uh, like health or like environment or like uh, economics. And very often the systemic risks have repercussions or implications on all of these different targets on different silos uh, in which political uh, affairs are being governed. And so it's very important to see that they are really transsectoral and they're also transdisciplinary and they're very often also transboundary. So the second point is that they're very complex and interconnected. And that means that one risk is interconnected with another and that they both amplify the effects. We have seen that a little bit already when I talked about uh, the five agents of risks. The third thing is they are stochastic. And the stochastic element, of course, is something that's typical for risk, but specifically for systemic risk, which means we cannot predict who is being affected to what effect. We can only have a distribution of effects over larger populations. And we've seen that in Corona, we cannot tell you, you know, you will be affected by it or you. We could say, well, there is a probability that you get affected, but there is also a probability that you're not getting affected. And we don't know if you will get it or not. Um, and this stochastic effects has major impacts also on our perception. Uh, people who need to change their behavior are normally thinking that uh, they are on the left side of the uh, Goth 
distribution curve of the normal uh, distribution curve, meaning, well, they are protected and nobody, uh, no virus will really get to them, though they are overconfident. Uh, those people who want others to change are mostly very, very, or think of them as very, very sensitive to the risk. And they will ask the government and others to make, you know, very drastic measures to um, protect them. And that's part of the climate that we've seen also in all of our populations, that we have a whole set of populations that are on the left side of the normal distribution curve and saying nothing will happen as this, you know, the probability that I get affected is very low. And the other side of the, the curve will say, oh, I'm always the one that gets it. And, um, and I am very sensitive uh, to all kinds of perils. And it's very likely that I will get it. So please protect me more than everybody else. And so it's this kind of uh, uh, expectation specific towards governance that make it much more difficult in stochastic situations to have the right um, balance of measures um, that are feasible or, uh, let's say, um, proportional to the um, um, challenge. The fourth one, so we had now three stochastic, the fourth one is that we very often have tipping points. That's not so much true for the crisis right now, but we do have tipping points uh, where we see that things are getting, um, uh, that we intervene, for example, when specific uh, measures have been reached, uh, or that uh, um, a more, um, you know, a, a domino effect is being released uh, once as a specific um uh, um, a distribution and spread of the virus is reached, but for many other systemic risks we have these tipping points that something uh, is happening only once the threshold is being exceeded. And uh, the last point that is important here is that uh, uh, these uh, systemic risks are very often also underestimated at the beginning and then overestimate it uh, when they are coming. And then it takes a little while before, you know, a good balance is, uh, has been reached. And I think we've seen that in the pandemic very, very well. Now, these kind of characteristics are very important to understand. Uh, first, the properties of the risk itself, uh, but also for understanding the responses of people to these. So, for example, I already mentioned that people respond to stochastic events in a very different manner depending on whether they feel they are not vulnerable or whether they feel they're very vulnerable. And then they come up with very, very different conclusions about what the government should do. But also in terms of the transgressive nature of it, it's very important because most of our governance systems are based on topical management. Uh, so we know how to manage energy, we know how to manage substance, we know how to manage um, biota, but if all these things come together, then it's getting extremely difficult because we have silos of responsibility in the governmental organizations, and that means we need to have a much better bridge between these organizations in order to make policies work in the right direction. Also, what's quite important there is that uh, the tipping points often um, um, allow people to think they are in good shape because they have not reached the tipping point. And since we all learn by trial and error, since there is no error, we start to um, you know, develop routines uh, because there's no negative feedback. And once these tipping points are exceeded, and then, of course, it's sometimes extremely difficult first to undo the damage, but also to change the routines. And we've seen that also specifically in issues like climate change or others where people uh, know that there is something coming up, but because it's not affecting them directly, they don't change routines. And if indeed climate change would have a major impact on their life, it may be too late to make all these changes. So let me come to my third point, and that's a risk governance point. So how do we deal with it? So we know now the various you know, um, patterns of um, risk agents and also the risk absorbing systems. We know the properties of systemic risks. So what can we do in terms of risk governance in order to make, um, uh, you know, to make you know, better management efforts to reduce the risk and to give protection to the people that we serve. 
The first thing is that it's very important. Systemic risks, like, like pandemics, are rare, but there are many of them. And if you have many of rare events, it means that one of them is going to happen pretty soon. <laughs> and that is something that's very difficult to understand because we eat, look at each of them separately and then, of course, say, oh, it's rare. You know, last big pandemic in the world was, you know, before, um, uh, sorry, directly uh, after World War I. And uh, so it's more than 100 years ago. And nevertheless, um, that some of these systemic risks are actually occurring is fairly likely. We all just don't know which one. So this time it was a pandemic. Maybe next time is that, uh, you know, we have a big um, cybersecurity problem and the whole internet is uh, going to be damaged and we cannot use it anymore. And that, of course, would be a disaster for the world. And uh, because we know that there are many systemic risks around, but we don't know which one, it is very prudent to invest into resilience. And resilience means we are not looking at the drivers. We know they're coming and they're interconnected. We are looking at the risk-absorbing system and make it less vulnerable, regardless of what comes. So we would invest in redundant services, we would invest in diversity of services, we would invest in um, multiple channels of providing crucial, critical infrastructural needs. All of that is an investment in resilience. And to be very clear about it, if you invest in resilience, you do not invest in efficiency. They are in contrast to each other. A very efficient system is, you know, it's very efficient and it doesn't cost a lot of money, but it's not resilient and the other way around. So it's up to the society to uh, make a trade-off between resilience and efficiency. And if you think about systemic risk like pandemics, it is much better to invest quite a bit in resilience. So if the worst case happens, you can much better cope with it. And this was a very good example. And Germany was pretty well equipped in terms of the health system. And a lot of people have criticized that we have so many bets on uh, um, high intensive care units in hospitals, uh, which were not used. Uh, and now we were happy that we had them. And I think the very low toll in terms of deaths in Germany was partly due that we had invested a lot in resilience in our health system. And, um, and we know that you know, Germany doesn't have even 10,000 uh, um, fatalities there. And uh, it's one of the, the least fatalities all over the world, um, given the number of infected people. And this is, I think, a direct, a really direct consequence of a fairly prudent investment in resilience. So that's my first and very important element. We need to invest in resilience. A second point is that it's very important for systemic risks like pandemics to understand the key nodes. The key nodes are those where uh, different implications come together or are triggered. And for the pandemic, it was very clear air travel. Uh, if we didn't have air travel, I think we would not talk about corona at all. Um, the coronavirus was transported via air from Wuhan into the rest of the world and from there again to major hubs. And we can see everywhere where we had major hubs, we, this was a spreading point uh, for the virus. And that's a very important element. I mean, it's interesting to note that the virus did not spread from southern China to northern China. Uh, North of China was hardly affected by it. Um, so just by land, it wasn't uh, very uh, infectious. Uh, but through airplane uh, transportation, it was really spread throughout the world. And so that's a second major lesson, I think, to say what is the most critical knot. And in, in pandemics, it is the air traffic. And closing down air traffic very soon and maybe having a fund for the airline industry so that they are not getting bankrupt afterwards is another major element of what we can properly do. The third one, I think, which is uh, very important is integration across sectors and across boundaries. Uh, we have seen very often, and I'm afraid also in Hungary, that uh, there is a, a call back to nationalism. But when we look really closely, international cooperation has been one of the major drivers for good governance rather than for bad governance. And also cross-sector, as I said, from one ministry to the other, we need to be sure that we have that kind of cooperation and cooperation among and between different agencies, between different organizations, also between different countries, is crucial 
for dealing with this kind of crisis. And I'm glad that many countries have done so, others have not. And I think they didn't fare much better by you know, uh, closing all their boundaries and trying to do everything by themselves. The fourth one, I think what is important is that since um, these systemic risks can also change in nature and have all these secondary and tertiary impacts because they're interconnected with uh, different domains, it's very important that we have a very good monitoring system. A monitoring system before the crisis comes so that we can actually acknowledge the weak signals, but also a very good monitoring system during the crisis. And I think through the whole pandemics, we have seen that good monitoring has also helped to reduce the number of infections and to be more effective in curbing the spread of the virus. Um, monitoring is extremely important because it, it tells us a little bit how the risk is actually being distributed in space and time, and that makes it much more instrumental or more, or it makes it just easier uh, to uh, come up with the right uh, countermeasures. And lastly, I think what I would also stress and I would also like to close with is that uh, because so many people are affected in different ways, it's very important to include stakeholders and affected publics in the decision and planning process. Now, I'm totally aware that in the middle of the crisis, you cannot make a big public participation process of what to do, because then it is very time sensitive and you have to do it very quickly. However, before you have the crisis, it may be much better to be prepared by having good um, emergency uh, commissions and boards um, that are um, composed of people from different backgrounds, different disciplines, different political agencies, different political organizations, but also stakeholders. So that in the case of an emergency, you can put these people together because they're already in place and you can discuss the countermeasures. This is even more important when it comes to secondary and impact, tertiary impacts. Uh, so, you know, when the pandemic has an impact on the economy, on the social life, on uh, uh, people's individual well-being, now then it's not just the virologist and the epidemiologist they're asked for. We need a new psychologist, social scientist, economists, uh, anthropologists. All of them are highly needed in order to define first what is the problem, but secondly what are potential solutions and to be proportional in your solutions. That is extremely important. So this ends basically my um, contribution. I hope uh, that uh, you uh, learned a little bit about why the risk perspective has a very important uh, contribution to the management and governance of the crisis that we are just going through. And I'm very much looking forward to our discussion and I will be live on the discussion, but of course, through internet. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Bye-bye.